Uh, we've been talking about uh, last week, uh, really uh, the first uh, couplet, uh, our identity choices. Uh, the first two choices are identity choices. Why am I here? Uh, who am I? And why am I here? Uh, those are identity choices. And the answer uh, is, uh, my identity is this, I am loved by God. And uh, I am forgiven by God. Now, those two things will change your identity. They will absolutely and categorically change uh, your view of God, of self, of life, uh, of reality. And, uh, but you have to choose it. I choose God's love. Uh, I choose God's forgiveness. Now, these are universal needs. I want you to know that. The need for God's love the needs for God's forgiveness. These are universal needs. This is true of every person in your family, every person on your street, every person where you work. Every person desperately needs those two things. There will always be an aching in your heart, an aching there until you fill it with, I am loved by God, I am forgiven by God, and more importantly, I choose to believe I am loved by God last week, and now this week, I choose to believe that I am forgiven by God, okay? We're going to put our hand on something very excellent right now. Let's take a moment first uh, and pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of bowing before you. It's right that we should humble ourselves before the creator of the universe, and how great is the love with which you have loved us. Seeing us in our, our true condition as we really are, knowing us better than we know ourselves, seeing what we are so reluctant to admit about ourselves. And so I pray as your word goes forth today that you would uh, use it, God, shine a searchlight upon us that we might see ourselves clearly and that we might find in you the forgiveness that our hearts so desperately need. These things I pray and to ask in faith and in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Open a Bible if you have your hands on one or share with a person next to you or reach onto the chair in front of you and let's get all get our eyes on God's Word. Open with me to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 and I want to read a particular account from the life of Jesus Christ for a foundation of what I want to share with you. Jesus had finished his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount and he had begun a couple of chapters of healing showing his power that he was God's Son that he was not just a good uh, moral uh, person, that he was not just a, a capable teacher, but that he was God of very God who had become flesh. Uh, he had the power to heal. And uh, so the stories continue through chapter 8, and chapter 9 begins this way. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Notice again, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Last time, look at it in verse 6. So that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Now, how many people here like good news? Like good news? How many people like good news? Be honest, humor the preacher, put your hand up if it's true. How many people like good news? All right? I think that's pretty unanimous. We like good news. Here's something I'd submit to you. Sometimes people like good news so much that preachers just give good news. The problem is you can't really appreciate the good news until you get the bad news, all right? The good news is never really as good until the bad news is understood. Whoever gets excited about a solution to a problem they don't recognize. Now, I promise you, I promise. Everyone say he promises. I promise to get to the good news but not before we spend a good amount of time on the bad news, so you will really appreciate it when we get there. Start with this, the problem. The problem is sin. The problem is sin. I mean, I guess I can see what these religious leaders, these scribes were saying to Jesus. Uh, he uh, says to the paralytic man, he, he's like, uh, they bring this, this uh, uh, crippled uh, man, paralyzed man in on a cot, and, and uh, they're like, can you heal this guy? Because we heard you could like heal people. 
and, and Jesus is like, your sins are forgiven. And they're like, I don't know if you were listening, but, but we're, we're not really, this isn't like a sin thing. This is like a healing thing. His problem isn't in his soul or whatever you call it. It's in his what? It's in his body. We, we want him healed, okay? And so you can see why they got a little upset, uh, especially because they thought that uh, Jesus was just a man. They didn't understand at this point that he was God and had the authority to forgive sins. But in God's eyes, you need to understand this. In God's eyes, sin and sickness are not that far apart. In fact, I would suggest to you that sin is the ultimate cause of every human problem. Sin is behind everything that is wrong in our world. Sin is the source of every human problem. Now, I mean problem of substance, okay? I'm not talking about sin is why you're late for work, though that may be involved, actually. I'm not saying that sin is why you, uh, you know, lost your car keys or why there's a long line at Walmart, all right? I'm talking about sin is behind every problem of substance in the universe. For example, sin is behind every planet problem. That's because of sin. Volcanoes are because of sin. Tsunamis are because of sin. Uh, earthquakes, famine, flooding in my basement, the weather system so twisted and broken and getting worse is because of sin, all right? The universe is broken, all right? The sun is burning out. The earth is turning slower and slower every year, scientists tell us. The whole world, the universe, it's winding down. It's getting worse. It's twisted. It's broken. Romans 8 uh, says that the whole creation was subjected to futility. Romans 8 also says that the, the created world, the universe, that it's, uh, it, it, it's in bondage to decay. All it can do is break down and fall apart and get worse and worse and worse. The planet itself is broken. When Adam and Eve chose to sin and plunge the human race into sin, God stepped forward in the early chapters of Scripture and cursed the planet. It's broken. It doesn't work right. And God's not trying to fix it. Not now. Someday. That was a great spot for an amen. Someday. Amen. But not now. All right? The world is twisted and broken. Every planet problem is because of sin. Every people problem in our bodies Every, every physical problem that you and I have, every struggle that we have now or will have in the future, all of it is because of sin, all right? Because we're twisted and broken. Every cancer, every heart failure, every debilitating disease. Now, we weren't made this way. When God made us originally in the Garden of Eden, we were perfect. And all God's people said, what were we? Perfect. Lift up your voice, what were we? Adam and Eve were perfect, all right? But when they chose to sin, that tore at the fabric of what God made them to be, and God judged them with, with the same twisted brokenness that the creation have. We're part of that as human beings, and we have it too. We are tw twisted and broken. We weren't made that way, not originally, but we are that way now, all of us. Not just twisted and broken in our bodies, but every people problem in the soul, every act of greed and selfishness is because we are twisted and broken. Every breaking of God's law, every violation of another person, every self-exalting, others debasing, wounding action is because of sin. The planet is broken, it's twisted. The human body is broken and twisted and the human soul, the part of us that lives forever, it's broken. It's subjected to decay. It's in bondage to futility. Now, we used to be perfect. We're not so anymore. You could pick up a newspaper and read it. What's on this page? It's the result of sin. Look at the problems on every page, the greed, the selfishness, the pride, the, the, the quest for power, the sexual sin, the perversity, running rampant and, and getting worse. Everyone say getting worse. Can you see it? Okay, all in favor of the truth? All right, this is the way it really is. It's getting worse. 
and worse. Scripture says that evil men will go worse and worse. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse until God himself comes back and steps onto the world stage and writes all that is wrong. It's all because of sin. Romans 5.12 says, For as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death has passed to all men, because of all, all have sinned. Uh, we are uh, born as sinful people. We are, we are sinful by birth. We are sinful by nature. We are sinful by actions. We, we are sinful. And if anyone doubts that, I'll turn back. You can turn or listen, your choice. But uh, Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments is so confirming. God has laid down a law. We are lawbreakers. Exodus 23 says, you shall have no other gods before me. How's that going? Nothing more important than God ever. And to fail in that is to sin. It's to distort the very purpose for which I was created. And anybody struggling with that? God always, first, all the time, anything else is sin. Anyone, anyone else ever struggle with that? Don't leave me up here by myself. Do you, you know what I mean? That's just one thing. And then, um, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You shall not ever, by what you say or by what you do, ever do anything that ever minimizes the importance of God. Not ever. Not ever. Don't speak flippantly about God. Don't joke about Him. D don't do anything ever that would ever minimize the importance of God. How's that going? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. One day a week for rest. One day a week. Total rest. No work. Just you and God growing in that relationship. Honor your father and mother. Don't ever do anything under any circumstances that would ever do anything than honor your mom and dad. You say, well, you don't know my mom and dad. I don't see that part in here. <laughs> honor them. This is God's law. Honor them. Always. Unequivocally. And to do otherwise, it's sin. Don't murder. You say, I think I'm okay there. But Jesus said, if you hate someone in your heart, you're a murderer. You're just lacking the courage or the opportunity. It's only the fear of the consequences that keeps you from doing the thing that your heart wants to do. If you hate, you're a murderer. I've hated people. I'm a murderer. I'm a sinner. You shall not commit adultery. Check. Except that looking on a woman, Jesus said, and lusting after her in your heart, again, just lacking the opportunity, just lacking the courage, just fearful of the consequences, if I could do it and get away with it. Don't steal. Don't lie ever about anything, even to yourself. Don't covet. Don't want what isn't yours. Don't want your neighbor's house. Don't wish you had his car. Don't wish you had his wife. Don't wish you had anything. Don't covet things. And that's just 10 things, just like the top 10. You say, well, really, though, sin, I mean, isn't this some kind of an ivy tower, ivory tower problem? I mean, don't, isn't this something that theologians wrestle with? No, I think it's kind of a big deal at your house. I think it's a pretty big deal in your life. And if you struggle with that, listen to these five things the Bible says about your sin and mine. Number one, the Bible says that we are determined sinners, that very little can stop our passionate pursuit of sin. David said in Psalm 51, 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Nothing in this world is our world. Nothing are we as remotely even devoted to 
as we are devoted to sin. We are devoted to it. I don't have to give any pep talks about it. I don't have to keep that thing, sin thing going, man. Don't get discouraged. I know it's hard out there to keep sinning. You never need a, how many people agree? I've never needed a pep talk about that. Never needed someone to kind of coach me. Now doing the right, I need a lot of input to keep that going in the right direction. Leave me alone for a while, bam! Off I go in my sinful bent, whatever it is that my, and we all have different bents. We all have different things we struggle with. And I don't judge you for yours. I have mine, but I'm just telling you it's the way it really is. We are determined sinners. Four more. Jot these down. We are determined. We are diseased. This is a spiritual disease. Genesis 6, 5 says, Then the Lord saw that the wicked... Pardon me, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great and that every intent of his thoughts was only evil continually. Sin is a virus of the soul. It is gangrene of the heart. It is eating away at the fabric of your being and will do so until it consumes you. That is sin. We are determined, we are diseased. This makes it a lot harder. We are deceived. We are deceived about it. Even as I talk this, there's something inside you. I know it's true, and I see it in some of your faces. There is something inside you that does not want this to be true. You you are deceived. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is deceitful. Your heart will deceive you. You will look at something that is not righteous to have, and you will see it and savor it and seek it until you convince yourself that it is righteous and believe your own lies like they are the gospel. We are deceived. We are blind to the reality of the truth that I now proclaim to you. We are determined and diseased and deceived, and we are desperate. We are desperate sinners grasping for something Jeremiah 17, 9 continues, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. We are desperate about this. Like a quarterback with a broken shoulder, like an accountant who cooked the books, like a banker who embezzled, like a lawyer who lied under oath, we have failed where we needed to succeed. We have fallen where we had to stand, and we are desperate because of it. There is no way out of this condition on ourself. You can't fix this. You can't solve it. You can hardly even diagnose it, let alone fix it. We are desperate, and we are destined. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. Had there been no sin, there would be no death. Adam and Eve would still be alive and walking the earth today with all of their descendants in joyful fellowship with the God who made them. All of this twistedness, all of this brokenness, everything happening in the universe and in your heart that is wrong and sideways is because of sin. Ezekiel 18, 20 says, the soul that sins, it shall die. And that doesn't just mean a physical death. That would hardly be a prophecy. We're all going to die. Not just to die physically, but to die spiritually. You're like, James, where is all this going exactly? Well, I'm sorry that you had to ask, if you had to ask. And I'm sorry that you don't know where it's going if you don't know where it's going. Jot this second thing down. The problem is sin, and the prognosis is perish. The least emphasized and most important not to overlook part of John 3, 16 is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish. So, Everyone who does not believe in him then will perish. They will. Everyone. And not a few people. Not when you rightly understand sin. Not when you rightly understand the holiness of God. This is not surprising at all. Perish means to suffer in hell. To experience the just wrath of Almighty God. 
perish means eternal death sentence. It's shocking to me the degree to which people ignore reality. Hebrews 9.27 says that it is appointed unto man once to die. You get one chance at this. You get one life. And a lot of people exit early. Man, I did not see that off-ramp coming. You better get ready now. All right? You better get ready now. No one knows. The Bible says, what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a moment and vanishes away. You don't know that you have another week or another month. I heard the story of several deaths this week very close to us and to our church. No one knows how long they have. Everyone thinks they're going to heaven. That's part of the problem. Everyone thinks, well, I'm going. I mean, I know a lot of people that are worse than me. Okay, God's not your college professor, okay? He does not grade on the curve. Okay? That is not how it works. And if you think that, you are sadly misinformed. Jesus said, broad is the road that leads to destruction. Many people are going that way. Narrow is the road that leads to eternal life. Only a few are finding it. Almost every single person you know is going to perish. Many people in the church of Jesus Christ are going to perish. Jesus said, many people will come to me and be like, I did all these things for you, and I taught Sunday school, and I led a small group, and I served in the parking lot. Matthew 7, and he's going to be like, I didn't even know you. You were just some religious person going to church. The prognosis is perish. People are so slow to embrace this reality. It's interesting, isn't it? You know, we... Someone, you feel a lump on your breast or in your neck or, or you, you have some uncertainty about something and all of a sudden they're sliding into one of those tubes and you're getting all the chest x-rays and you can't sleep and you're pacing back and forth and you run to the doctor and say, doctor, doctor, am I going to die? The answer is yes. He's only helping you understand when, all right? He, he can only work on when. He has no involvement in if. He's just about when. And yet people spend all of their energy on when, 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 and spend no time at all thinking about the most certain thing of all, death. Not ready, not, repair, not prepared, not choosing. You can choose. You really can. You say, well, I've only uh, been to Harvest a few times, but you're starting to sound like one of those hellfire and brimstone preachers. Let me, let me just ask you something. What would you think of an accountant who didn't tell you you were bankrupt? What would you think of, an, of a lawyer who didn't tell you you're going away for the rest of your life and I can't help you? What would you think of a doctor who wouldn't tell you, you have two weeks to live? You'd say, well, they'd be worthless. And how much more worthless a preacher who only wants to tell you the good news and never really brings to bear upon you the reality of your own undone condition before God and the certainty of your perishing. Shh, shh, shh. And listen. You say, well, James, what, I don't hear a lot about hell. What, what, what exactly uh, is going on there? Hell is eternal, conscious torment. Hell is the place of God's wrath and God's judgment that will never end. Hell is a place of punishment where the flames never cease and the thirst never quenches and the darkness never ends. Do you want to go there? Do you want anyone you know to go there? As awesome as heaven will be, hell will be that awful, and you would not wish it on your worst enemy if you rightly understood what God's Word says about it. The problem is sin, and the prognosis is perish. And unless God had stepped in, nothing would alter that course. That's reality. That's who we are. That's who our parents and grandparents and ancestors have been. 
And this brief moment called life is a chance for you to choose. Ready to choose? Ready for some good news? Jot this down, the provision. Incredibly, unimaginably, the provision is forgiveness. Forgiveness. You, you and I can be forgiven of our sin. Forgiven. Back to Matthew 9. The story of Jesus and the paralytic man. And when he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, What do you think? Why do you think evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Notice first that Jesus was not going to heal the guy's body without healing his soul. He's like, what exactly would be the benefit of getting this guy up on his feet for the next 10 minutes so he could fall into hell? And so Jesus put first things first. He said, dude, let me, let me deal with your eternal problem, and then we'll work on your next 10 minutes problem. And that's why he said to him, your sins are forgiven. That's why he put the spiritual matters first, not the healing of his body. And then notice that strong assertion. I have the authority to forgive sins. Jesus Christ has the authority to forgive sins. No one else in all the universe can make that claim. God has granted to his son the authority to forgive sins. You can't get that anywhere else. Do not get caught on a B plan, okay? Only Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Only him. In fact, the same story of the paralytic's healing is told in uh, two of the other gospels. In one of the Gospels, they said, who can forgive sins but God alone? That's what they said. They're like, who can forgive sins but God alone? To which Jesus could have easily replied, correct, correct. No one can but God. Now you're getting it. Now you're getting it. He is God. He is the God who became man. He's the one who has the authority to forgive sins. Unless you should wonder about God's forgiveness. I don't make this up. Can I just read to you a little bit about God's forgiveness? Can I do that? Can I just read to you some scripture, what it, what it says about you and God and what he would like to do if you would choose? God is a forgiving God. Exodus 34, 6, then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin, yet he will by no means clear the guilty. 86.5, Psalm 86.5, for you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive, abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. Amen? And then jot this reference down, loved ones. Micah 7.8, who is a God like you who pardons iniquity who does not retain his anger forever, but delights in unchanging love. That's the fact of God's forgiveness. Now, the extent of God's forgiveness. Psalm 103, 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. God won't just take your sin away from you. He'll put it so far away you can't find it anymore. That's how forgiven you'll be. He's not gonna be like next morning, oh yeah, I was thinking about that thing last night and I spoke a little too soon, now I'm mad again, all right? God's not like that. Everyone say, God's not like that. He will put your sin so far away from you, you couldn't find it if you wanted to. He will totally forgive you. He will never bring it up again. I love that. Notice Micah 7, 19. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. What size do you suppose is God's foot? I'm thinking it's fairly large large enough to get all of our sin underneath. Yes, he, he will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Listen to this, Ezekiel 36, 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and all of your idols. And then the blessing of forgiveness, Psalm 32, 1. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. It's so true, isn't it? 
You think of the broad road and the number of people with their sin hanging over them, and you think of the few people who find the forgiveness of their sins in God. How blessed is the one whose sins are covered. How, how eternally blessed is the one whose sins are covered. So I'm th- Ezekiel 36, 26. Verlin quoted this to us a couple of weeks ago. I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove your heart of stone. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. It's a provision of God's forgiveness. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to be forgiven? Don't don't you want to be forgiven? Don't you want to have all of that sin washed away? Are there not many things hanging in the attic of your conscience that you long to have washed clean? I was reminded this week as I was preparing to talk to you about uh, one of the Shakespearean plays that we studied in uh, high school, uh, Macbeth. Lady Macbeth convinces herself to slay the king and take the throne. And uh, so the plan was to frame the servants by planting the bloody knives on them. So she gets her husband to do the murdering, but then foolishly, stupidly, he comes back with the bloody knives right to her. So she takes the knives, goes and tries to hide them with the servants, but as the play, the Shakespearean play progresses, we see her pitifully, increasingly consumed with the weight of the sin that she chose. One of the most famous and most tragic scenes, Act chapter 5, scene 1, has her standing over a sink. Uh, The the stains physically long ago washed away, but spiritually they're still there and she can see them and she's, she's, she's pitifully wringing her hands under the water and saying, oh, damn spots! And, And she cannot get her conscience clean. And she's just like you and me. She cannot fix that herself and neither can we. No amount of goodness can wash away sin. No amount of human kindness can solve the debt of our own violation of God's law. Nothing in ourselves can wash that away. Everyone say nothing. She's not so different than you and me. We need God's forgiveness for the sin that hangs in the corner of our consciousness and cannot be washed away by itself. And she, like us, apart from some external, key sentence, apart from some external cleansing agent, will take our sin to the grave and into hell itself. But because of God's grace, grace is when we get what we don't deserve. And because of God's mercy, not getting what we do deserve, because of God's grace and because of God's mercy, we can be forgiven. You're like, this sounds like a a pretty good deal, this forgiven by God thing. So so God's going to just like wipe away my sin? God's just going to be like, ah, never mind. It's okay. Uh, No, no, no. You do not understand in any sense the gospel if you think that God is going to lightly dismiss sin. Sin is not a trifle. It is a terror. So you have to get this next part. The problem is sin. The prognosis is perish. The provision is forgiveness. But now get this. The payment is Christ. The payment is Christ. This is the good news of the gospel. This is what separates biblical Christianity from all false religions of the world, including aberrant Christianity itself. In all false religions, and there are many false ones and one true one, one authored by God himself, in all false ones there is this thread, I will do this myself. I will get there. I will show God how serious I am. I will prove to him how good I am. And and in every aberrant religion, you find people cutting themselves and walking on their knees and doing penance and kissing rings and bowing down and and making a journey to some sacred location and, and, and doing 
for God what God has already done for us in Christ. That's the glory of the gospel, that God so loved the world. (laughs) He loved the world so much, and believe me when I tell you, he's not talking about the planet, all right? When the Bible says that God loves the world, it means that God loves you. God loves you, and he knows you perfectly. Even in your sin, he sees it all. There's no hiding or pretending. Yet his love for you is so great that he did for you what you could not do for yourself. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world, and he died a substitutionary death on your behalf. He took upon himself the punishment for your sin. Isaiah 53, written a thousand years before Jesus Christ, prophesied of his life and said, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He bore our sin. He bore our sin. He became sin for us. Who knew, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, the scripture says. This is the gospel. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. This is the gospel. The substitutionary atoning payment of Jesus Christ for your sin. Now I'm here to tell you, It is the only way to have your sin forgiven is to throw your arms around that with your whole heart, with all that you have, the payment of Christ. 1 John 4, 10, and this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the payment for our sin. Now the choice No one can do this for you. The choice is believe. The choice is believe. It's interesting here in Matthew 9, other gospels tell the same story, but they add some detail. Jesus was in a house, and he was teaching, and the crowds were packing out the house and packing out the courtyard and out into the streets. And here comes these people carrying this this paralytic man on a cot. They couldn't even get in the driveway. But let me tell you something faith will find a way. And they knew that their only hope was Jesus. They knew they had no hope without him. And so they somehow squeezed through the crowd. They climbed up on the roof. And they began, not easy to do in New Testament times, to peel back the straw and the mud and the chalk all together. Think of it hardened in the Middle Eastern sun. And somehow they pried it away and pulled back the planks and lowered their friend down through the roof. That's why it says here in Matthew 9, the version of the story that I'm reading, And when he saw their faith, verse 2, when he saw their faith, read the other stories, you'll know what he means. And these guys went to a lot of trouble to get to Jesus. They had to overcome some serious obstacles to get to him. Faith overcomes obstacles. When I say the choice is believe, I mean really believe. Look up here. I mean you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, the Scripture says. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be forgiven. But I'm not talking about some shallow mental ascent. Oh, yeah, that's good. I'm good with that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the kingdom of God shall be compared to a merchant who, having found one pearl of great price, sold everything that he had and went and got that one pearl. of Jesus is the pearl of great price. He is the one that you give everything up that you have to get the forgiveness of your sins, and not one person who does it will regret it for one second in eternity. Amen. He is worth all of it and more. And I don't mean some shallow, half-hearted, oh yeah, I'm in with Jesus thing. I mean you give him everything. You give him your life. You believe on him. You trust in him completely so that if someone were to say to you, if you were to die today and you were to stand before God and he were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? You'd be like, because of Jesus? I can't believe I even get to talk. But Jesus, 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 not me. It's not by works of righteousness, which I have done, but according to his mercy, he saved me. For by grace, you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's a gift. You say, well, how do I get the gift? You've got to reach out and take it. That's what believing is. You've got to reach out and take it. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And you do have to overcome some obstacles to really believe. You say, well, what obstacles are we talking about here? Just two, or two ways really of saying the same thing. Number one is your pride. The pride of thinking that I'm good enough. I'll make it without Jesus. 
that is wicked pride that will cause your soul to perish. I want you to imagine something. Look up here, let me tell you a story. I want you to imagine something for a moment. I want you to imagine, all of you, that you have a son, and that somehow through a series of circumstances, your son and I became very close friends. We were very close. We would do anything for each other. We lived together, we worked together, we worshiped together, we traveled together, we did everything. Me and your son, except I really got off the track and I got angry and hateful and I made a terrible choice and in a fit of rage I went out and I killed someone and the police found me and caught me and threw me into prison and the trial was short and the evidence was great and I was sentenced to death and your son was broken hearted and through some quirk in the judicial system. You were troubled even to hear of it, that your son was down there pleading if there was some way that I, that, that I wouldn't have to die. And some strange judge, you never know what they're going to do, said, well, the law demands that someone die. And your son loved me so much, he stepped in and took death in my place, took what I deserved. You think about how you'd feel, your son. But worse still, imagine that a few days later you overheard me in conversation, chatting with someone, and they said, well, I thought you were, you, were, you killed, I thought you, how did you, why are you out, what, what happened? And they said, well, they, they, um, they started looking at my record and they found out that even though I'd killed that guy, that overall I wasn't really that bad and, and that overall I, I, you know, in the big picture I was a pretty good guy. So, so they decided to let me go free because I'm not that bad after all. You standing there thinking of your son, what he did for me, and now I'm saying that it's because of me. How great would be your rage? And the Bible says, of how much greater punishment will he be considered worthy who tramples underfoot the blood of Christ and puts the blood of the covenant to open shame. I'm telling you, hell will not be deep enough to satisfy the wrath of God in regard to those who think they didn't need what Jesus did for their forgiveness. Trust me on that. How could words describe how desperately we need someone to pay for our sin? The idea of, a, of some little bit of goodness eclipsing the stench in the nostrils of God because of the sin that I am and the sin that I've chosen. It's insane to think that, and I have to get over the obstacle of my own pride if I'm going to be forgiven. Secondly, I have to get over my stubbornness. My stubbornness. I'll do it later, I'll, I'll, I'll do it someday. I, it's probably true, but, but I don't really want my life altered in that way. I want to be in charge. I want to run the show. How could I bow the knee to Jesus? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. The problem is sin. The prognosis is perish. The provision is forgiveness. The payment is Christ. The choice is believe. You have to believe. And finally, the time is now. The time is now. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you understand? My heart's desire is that every single person hearing this message would receive God's forgiveness if you have not done so already. And that those who are in doubt would get it certain now. And so I have to pause and ask you, do you understand? Do you understand that sin is your problem and that hell is your future and that forgiveness is your need and that Christ is your provision and that faith, faith must be your choice? Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you understand? And are you ready to choose? Ready to choose. Ready to choose the forgiveness. That's your identity. You can say, I am forgiven by God. 
I choose to believe that I am forgiven by God. Why don't you bow with me in a word of prayer and let me just talk to you personally for a moment. Really, if we could just not even pack up, I don't want anyone to be a distraction to anyone else. If we could just be still for a moment. And let me just speak to you personally. How awesome that by God's Spirit, you, can I, you and I can talk now, just one-on-one. -on -one. As though God were pleading through me, I implore you, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God through faith in Christ. It is your only hope. Some of you here, you're sure you're not forgiven. A few weeks ago, I was talking about being lost, the state of unforgiveness. And someone told me the story of their sister who was with them, who looked right at them in that moment and said, he's talking about me, that's me. I am so lost. Listen, you can be found. You can cause God's heart to rejoice. You can be forgiven now and for all of eternity. See, I have set before you life and death, heaven and hell, forgiveness and punishment, Christ or your own way. I have set it before you. And if you don't know that you're forgiven, you can know now. Some of you are sure that you're not, and you can be. Some of you are not sure that you are, and you can be sure. You should pray this prayer from your heart. You should pray this. If you accept the fact that you're a sinner, if you believe that Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sin, and if you want to confess Christ now personally, just begin to pray that to Him. Just say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. It's not a piece of news to me. Just tell Him in your own words. Do it right now. Make the choice. Just say, God, I know I've broken your law. I know I've failed you. I know I've not been the person that you want me to be. I know that I deserve your judgment. I'm not resisting that reality. My pride is gone. My stubbornness is melting. I just want to know that I'm forgiven. I want to receive the gift of eternal life. You are offering, and I am receiving. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Come into my life and forgive me. I want to settle this once and for all. October 2007, I choose God's forgiveness. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord Jesus. Come into my life and wash me and make me clean. Grant to me, according to your mercy, the gift of eternal life. I receive it. I receive it. And I thank you in your holy name. Amen.